So <clears throat> the message is entitled uh, this evening, Welcome to the War. Welcome to the War. And I want to preach to you tonight about the fact that when we got in the Christian life, we got involved in a war. Now, obviously, I'm not referring to a physical war, but we've involved ourselves in a spiritual war. And that war that we find is with our, within our own selves. You see that here in Romans 7 where Paul is talking about the fact that there are two uh, laws at work in his body, in his flesh, and in his mind. Uh, one is the, you know, trying to pull him into that which is carnal, and one is that which is pulling into that which is spiritual. And that really is the picture uh, of the Christian life. You know, we are always being pulled in two directions. And the matter, it, it's, a, it's a question of whether or not we're going to yield to the flesh or yield to the spirit. Now, if you would, keep something in Romans 7. We're going to be in Romans a few times tonight, so you might want to just books, bookmark something there. But go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, of course, we talked about this morning about the simplicity of the gospel and how that, uh, you know, even a child can be saved. That it's so simple, uh, salvation, that even a small child can come to an understanding of the knowledge of the gospel. And, of course, we talked about the fact that... Uh, when we are born again in Christ, that uh, you know we are uh, become spiritual children. We become children spiritually, and what that means to us is that salvation, when you got saved, that does not guarantee that you are going to be a spiritual person. Right. You're not going to get saved and go to bed and wake up the next day and be this amazing Christian. You know, it's going to take work, and quite frankly, as the title "Welcome to War" would infer. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a fight. If you want to grow in Christ, if you want to excel in your Christian life, if you want to be pleasing to Christ, you're going to be involved in warfare, spiritually. So look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1 where it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So Paul here is rebuking them, of course, for saying, Look, I would like to speak to you as a spiritual adult. You know, and he's speaking to adults, by the way. And he's saying, look, I would like to address you as mature believers in Christ, but I could not address unto you uh, as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. So what was it that was making them babes? The fact that they were carnal. The fact that they weren't living a spiritual life. The fact that they were still living and walking in the flesh. He said in verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is envying among you and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So we see that just because you got saved, that just because you accepted Christ as your Savior, that, that you're not just going to automatically be a spiritual person. You're going to be saved. We understand that. You're going to be on your way to heaven no matter what. But along the way, if you want to excel in the Christian life, you are going to have to decide whether or not you're going to get involved in this fight and who it is that's going to rule and reign in your members. So we see here that carnality is something that has to be grown out of. You have to grow out of your carnality. You have to learn to put down the flesh. You have to learn to grow up spiritually. You have to grow into this. And this process is a struggle. That's what it is. You know, this growing into Christ, this growing out of your carnality, becoming a spiritual person, it's a struggle. You know, we think of, you know, I'm, I'm, an illustration would be, you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a, a locust or a, a grasshopper coming out of a cocoon, you know, a, out of a larva coming out of its cocoon. It doesn't just burst out easily. It's work. You think about a, a young chick trying to break out of an egg. You know, it has to work at it. It has to work at it. And that's what our spiritual life is. We start out as these small, you know, for lack of a better, you know, term, spiritual larva, you know, <laughs> in our car in our cocoon right and we want to spread our spiritual wings and soar to new heights but you know you got to grow into that yeah and it, it's a struggle it's a process it's a conflict it's a war if i could say that it's a battle of the wills that's what it is and that battle is between your flesh and the spirit the flesh and the spirit your physical flesh your carnality and the spirit of god which dwells in you are at odds with one another they can't get along there's never going to be a peace agreement. There's never going to be a truce. And that's the fact of life. You know, that's the fact of the Christian life. For the rest of your life, you're involved in this struggle. So I'm just going to try and encourage you tonight to not get weary in well-doing, to not give in to that temptation, to just go back into the flesh. And, you know, even if you've been one that's experienced setbacks in the Christian life, or you've, you know, <clears throat> you know maybe gotten a little backslidden, or, 
or try to uh, you know do something spiritual and it's fallen short, to not give up. Because it's a you know you might lose a battle here, you might lose a battle there, but the war's not over. Amen. And some days the flesh wins, and some days the spirit wins. But you know, as long as we keep fighting, you know we're gonna win. Amen. Now you're there in Romans seven, which is a tongue twister of a chapter, and look there in verse fourteen where he says, "For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not." For that I would, that I do not. Paul's saying here, that which he, uh, that's what he do, he would rather not do. And that would, what he wants to do, he doesn't do it. Right. And he says, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which uh, I would not, I consent unto law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. You see that sin nature is always there. Even when we're doing good. That's right. Evil never goes away. It's always present with him. For I delight in the law after the inward man, but I see another law. So what do you have? You have two laws. You have the, the law of God, which he delights after in the inward man, and then you see another law in his members. Warring against the law of my mind. He says it's war. And that's the title of the sermon. Welcome to the war. You are involved in warfare. This war between the flesh, which is warring against the law of your mind, the spirit, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? You know, it's interesting that Paul puts an exclamation point there and says, Oh, wretched man that I am. And we would say, Paul? Really? Probably the greatest Christian that's ever lived. You can make that argument. Probably uh, the man who's done more for Christ than probably anybody. You know, the author of the vast majority of the New Testament was used to write it. And he's saying he's a wretched man. And when I kind of look, think about that, it makes me think of the fact that people who are probably trying to live the Christian life the most probably understand this truth the most. The closer they get to God, they start to see how really wretched they are. Amen. The more they get involved in this fight, they, they realize how real the enemy is and how, real, how, how evil really is present with you at all times and how easy it is to just fall back into the flesh and be carnal. But when we get in the flesh, when we get carnal, when we're not living for God, we really don't see it that way. We kind of become blind to it. We say, oh, we're not that bad. We're okay. We're not as bad as so-and-so. We might compare ourselves. But Paul, the man who was doing the most for God, he says, I'm a wretched man. Because the closer he got to God, the more he did for God, the more he saw himself for what he really was. He said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know we have the victory. We know ultimately the battle's won, that sin shall not have the dominion over us. That, that one day we will receive that new body, that perfect man will be made whole in Christ. But until that day, friend, we are in a battle. Right. He said, so then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So again, no one gets saved one day and just wakes up spiritual the next. It's a process. It's a war. It's a battle. <laughs> and the process is bringing, about the fact, uh, is bringing the flesh into subjection of the spirit. That is the war. That is the struggle of break, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and bringing, it in, uh, and, and bringing it into subjection. Now go over to, again, keep something in Romans, but go over to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The Bible says in Galatians 5 verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. <clears throat> For the, lust, uh, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So Paul is making it very clear here that we can either walk in the spirit, or we can walk in the flesh. And there's no middle ground. We're either walking after one or the other. Some pe people get this idea sometimes that they can have one foot in the world, and one foot in, in, in Christ, and try to walk this this, this walk. You're not going to get very far like that. You got one foot up here and one foot down there. You know, you're trying to, it's like putting on a, a leg brace or something. 
you know, because you got, you know, you're lame here and you're trying to, trying to keep up. It's not going to work. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot, you know, living for the Lord and expect to make very good progress. And there's no middle ground. It's not like, well, I'm just neutral in the spiritual fight. You're going to fight somebody. No man can serve two masters, for he will love the one or hate the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And that's just a fact. And he's saying here that if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, of course, you know, you're not going to be perfect. No one's ever going to reach this sinless state of perfection. You know, we're all going to mess up. You know, the flesh is going to get the better of us sometimes here and there. But by and large, that should not be the pattern of our life, where it's just the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, every single day winning this battle, this war. And if we walk in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. <coughs> and he says that, uh, if, if, that if, you, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the, lu flesh of the, uh, the lust of the flesh because they're contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know, I believe that in every Christian, there's a desire to do the right thing. They want to do what's right. They want to get up. They want to read their Bibles. They want to pray. They want to go soul wedding. They want to be faithful to church. They want to learn the things of Christ. They want to have a godly biblical marriage. They want to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They want to do all these spiritual things. It's in their heart to do it. But until they get the flesh under control and bring it into subjection, you're not going to do those things that you would. You have to win this battle. You have to rein in the flesh and control it if you're going to do the things that you would. It's not enough to just desire it. You actually have to take steps towards bringing the flesh into subjection. <coughs> now, I will say this. It's optional. You can live the Christian life in the flesh. You can go, I'm not saying you can do it well. <laughs> I mean, you can go ahead and be a Christian and go to heaven and, and you can live a fleshly, worldly life. Wicked existence even, if you want. That is an option that's open to you. Because again, we understand that salvation is by grace. You know, it's not of works. That we, it's not about how, whether or not we do or don't sin. But if you want to you know, do the things that you would, you have to bring the flesh into subjection. But you have that option. And it's available to you, but you have to understand something. That it comes with consequences. That you are going to suffer the consequences for living in the flesh. Go ahead and turn back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Because people can get this idea and they just think, well, I'm just not going to live for God the way I should and I'll be all right. Well, you know, I just won't go completely back in the world. You know, I won't just be completely backslidden. You're still going to suffer the consequences, friend. It's, gonna, it, it's not just going to be without consequence. Look at verse 6, Romans 8 verse 6. He says, for to be carnally minded is death. That's a pretty severe consequence. Now, I understand that there's a broader truth here that, that Paul is trying to express about the law and about uh, 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 the carnal man and the, and the spiritual man. But he says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And isn't that what we all want? At least, you know, any of us that are halfway sane, right? We all want that life of peace. We want a spiritual, uh, a spiritual mind that is life and peace. Amen. You know, we want to have peace of mind. Well, you know, great peace have they that which love thy love and uh, which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. So, you know, if you want that, then you have to be spiritual. You can't just live in the flesh. And if we're carnal, if we walk after the flesh, there's going to be consequences. And he says here, to be carnally minded is death, because, verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity with, against God. It's not just that God disapproves of the carnal, man, of the carnal mind. That God just disapproves of not being spiritual. He's saying, look, the carnal mind is enmity with God. That means it's, it's his en enemy. They're foes. God is battling it. You know, it's, it's something that is going to war with one another. And we're caught right in there. We're, we're, we're in this battle. He says the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, uh, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live out of the flesh. Verse 13 
For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So it's just like when Joshua gave them the law before he passed out the scene, or Moses, rather, before he passed out the scene, I set before you today a blessing and a curse when he gave them the law. And that's the same truth for us today. We're given the law of God. We're given the word of God. We have the spirit of God in us. And that's either going to work for us or against us. It's either going to be living after the flesh. There's, we're going to die. Or if we live through the spirit, we're going to mortify the deeds of the body. And again, I understand the broader truth that he's teaching here is that we can't earn salvation by works because we're dead in the, we're dead in the flesh. The flesh, that, the flesh cannot please God. We understand that. But the principle that he's teaching here is that walking in the flesh, saved or unsaved, leads to negative outcomes. I mean, who's going to argue that? You know, who's going to get up and say, well, no, you can go and live a backslidden, worldly, uh, you know, ungodly life, and God's just going to you know, turn a blind eye and be fine with it. And you're not going to have any negative consequences. There's going to be negative consequences when we get into sin. Whatever it is, you know, and we could sit here and we could, and we could go down the list of sins that people get involved in, and talk about all the negative consequences. But truth be told, every one of those sins should probably just be preached on individually. And we'll get to that. But we all understand this, that when people get involved in sin, it comes with consequences. Yep. <clears throat> so don't get this idea that just because living a spiritual life or a carnal life is optional doesn't mean it's without consequences. <clears throat> the Bible says in Hebrews 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I mean, a scourging, <laughs> that's, that's not just a little pat on, you know, on the behind. I mean, that's getting out the whip. That's laying into somebody. That's what the Bible says God does to his children, that he scourges us. Now, we, of course, we understand that he doesn't do that physically, but that's, that can happen in our life. God can, make, can engineer circumstances. God can make things happen in your life. He can affect your job, your health, your family. God can reach down and touch you no matter where you are. Now, no matter what dark cave you think you've slithered down into, along with your sin, God can find you there right. and, and, and can start to work on you in ways you'd probably rather not. <clears throat> he says, He scourges every son whom he receiveth, but if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And he says, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You know, if you can go live a completely wicked life and never suffer any consequences at all, that would scare me to death. Because then I'd have to wonder, am I even saved? And he says right there, if, if, if he, uh, uh, God deal with his, his sons, but if ye be without chastisement, if God does not chasten you, whereof all are partakers, you know, he scourgeth every son and receiveth, then are you bastards? What does that mean? Fatherless and not sons. So, you know, that you want to test your sin. That's not, I don't recommend that as testing your salvation. You know? Let me go see how much sin I can involved in and see if God chastens me. You know? you know you're saved, you know, if you believe. But what he's showing us here is that, look, if God didn't chasten you, then you would be unsaved. Showing us that because you're saved, you can expect a chastening. That God's not just going to let you get away with it. That there are consequences for our sin. There are consequences. Why get involved in this war? Why get involved in this battle of the Christian life? Because being passive just leads to negative uh, uh, outcomes. Because tr trying to play spiritual Switzerland isn't going to work. You know, we're just not going to get involved. You know, just send all your money here. We're just going to sit this one out. It doesn't work that way. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a line in the sand. You're on one side or the other in this life. <coughs> So what that teaches us, that if we want to be spiritual, that if we want to bring uh, the, the law of our mind into subjection to Christ, if we want to live a spiritual life, you have to fight for that. You have to make that happen. It's not just going to be automatic. Right. You have to make decisions, concrete decisions in your life that are going to begin to lead you down a road of spirituality. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Can I trouble somebody for a glass of water? Thank you. <clears throat> so spirituality must be fought for. The Bible says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. 
And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I. He's saying he fights, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, bringing it into subjection. He's talking about his physical body, not fulfilling every desire of the flesh, bringing it into subjection. And he says that's a fight. That's something that he has to struggle against. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul's showing us if we're going to run this race, if we're going to get involved in this battle, that we're going to fight, and that that fight is bringing our flesh, our body, into subjection to the law of God. That when the flesh says, do this, I want this, and we read the Bible and it says, don't do that, we tell the flesh no. And you have to learn to say no to the flesh if you're going to live a spiritual Christian life that's pleasing to God. No has to become a part of your vocabulary. And it goes for all of us. No, you know, there's none of us that have reached this place in our life where we just can never be tempted with sin anymore. But we all have to learn this word. No. Flesh says, I want this. No. Don't do it. Don't give in. That's the fight. And that sounds easy to just say that. But we all know the real temptations that are out there. Especially if you're one that's coming out of the world that has a past, acquainted with sin. You know, it's a lot easier for those of us that have had a past. And I'm not glorifying this. And, you know, I, and, and I meant to say this this morning, you know, uh, the fact that a child can get saved at a young age, to me that is a better testimony. I wish I had that testimony. Amen. That is a more glorious testimony than, than the testimony of someone who just getting, you know, saved out of, out of a life of sin later. To me, that's my opinion. It's, that glorifies God more that, <laughs> that this person got saved at a young age and didn't have to go through all that. That God spared them that. God gave them the Spirit of God as a young child and gave them parents that could guide them and lead them and gave them the Bible to teach them right from wrong. Yep. That brings more glory to God. Amen. And, you know, I'm, I, I don't really, I don't want to go off on that, but here's the thing. If you want to be spiritual, you're going to have to fight for it and you're going to have to bring your flesh into subjection and tell it no. And the danger is that those of us that have come out of that kind of a background where we have whatever sin or sins, plural, that we've been involved in in the past, we have, an, it'd be easier for us to go back to that. Yeah, it'd be easier for us to just fall back because we're comfortable with it. Right. The person who's never done that, who's raised in a godly atmosphere and has been taught that that's wrong, that you shouldn't do that, if they tried to go do that, it, <laughs> it should scare them. Right. I can't imagine the, how, how that would make them feel. It should terrify them. Right. It probably would do so naturally. It prob that would just probably be the natural outcome. Some godly young man or woman raised in a godly home, knows right from wrong, has never gotten involved in this sin, starts to go towards that, feels tempted, and actually is going to go and, and give in to this temptation. I can't imagine the heart pounding, the palms sweating, the nervousness, the looking over the shoulders, the wide-eyed look, the fright that would go through them. But you take a guy that's saved out of that, he can go right into it. Yep. Not bad an eye. And just say, oh, I'm used to this. So we have to understand something. That spirituality has to be, spirituality has to be fought for. Amen. And that those of us that are coming out of that, you know, we should probably fight a little harder. Right. And not giving in to this flesh. And let me say this. Your flesh is not going to go without a fight. And it's going to fight you every single day. Some days will be better than others. Some days it, it, <laughs> you'll forget maybe that there even is a battle. But it's not going to go without a fight. Go ahead and turn over to James chapter 4. For James 4, I'll begin in verse 1. It says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? He says, Where are wars and fightings coming from? They're coming from within. They're coming from the lusts of our members. Ye lust and have not, and ye kill and desire to have, ye cannot obtain. You fight and war, and yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, but because ye ask and miss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is the enmity with God? Is enmity with God? Whosoever that will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? What's he saying there when he says that the spirit that dwelleth in us 
Lust is the envy. I don't believe he's referring to the Holy Spirit there. I believe he's referring to the fact our human nature is what he's referring to. And he's saying there that it, is, it lusteth to envy. Your flesh, the spirit of man that is in you, is always going to envy. It's always going to want what it used to have. It's always going to want what it can't have or shouldn't have. It's going to want those things that God says, no, you can't do that. Those things that God forbids. It's going to lust after those things. It's going to desire those things. He says in verse 5, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore God saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. How do you get the victory? How do you win this fight? You need to submit yourselves to God. You need to draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, it says there. You know, if you resist the devil long enough, he moves on to the next target. Not to say he'll never come back around, not to say he'll never try again, not to say he'll come back with a different angle, a different lure. I mean, you think of the fisherman, right? And this is a good illustration I heard once. The fisherman, he, you know, is like the devil. And he's got his rod with his lure on the end. And he's going to try and catch you by tempting you with this lure. And all he does is go around and cast over here and cast over there to see who'll bite. You know, if that lure's not working, he'll just switch lures. But I tell you what, if he keeps casting over in one direction and nothing's biting, he's going to move on to the next fishing hole. Yep, that's right. Not to say there isn't fish in there, but the fish in there have wised up and said, that's, I know what that is. That's not food. That'll make me food. Yeah. You know, that's going to put me on a plate. Right. And that's how the devil works. He just goes around. And here, so here's the, here's the thing. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But you have to resist him. And that is the language of a battle. That is, a, that is resist. Resistance. That's a fight. That's going against. Right? That is a warfare. And that's what we're involved in. And we have to learn to resist the devil. And that's, you know, a lot of us would probably just grow leaps and bounds spiritually by just doing that. By just resisting the devil when he tempts us to do something. When he wants us to do something we know we shouldn't be doing. <coughs> The flesh is not going to go without a fight because of our old nature. The spirit that dwelleth in us, it lusteth to envy. Our old nature is wicked. It's, and it's still there. Yes, we understand we're saved and we're, too, we have a, we're created in Christ Jesus. We're a new man. But we still have this old nature, our flesh. You know, we, when you got saved, you, know, you didn't get the new body. We're still dragging these bones around right. and this flesh around. And it's still wicked. It still has its same desires. It, has, it still has its same temptations. And it's not going to just go away. So we need to learn to fight it. The old man is dead, but he's still present. He's still present. Go back to Romans where you were. Look at Romans chapter 6. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. It doesn't say it is destroyed, that it might be destroyed. That one day it is going to be destroyed, that we will receive that new body. That henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. So our old man is crucified, but he's still there. He's still up on the cross, and he's still writhing in pain, and he's still crying out, let me down. And he still wants to be a part of your life. He doesn't want to die. <clears throat> and you know what? You say, well, I don't know that I, I, I appreciate that analogy. I, you know, I, I don't know uh, what you're really getting at. You know, could we preach on something else? But here's the thing. You're never going to win this war if you don't recognize the fact that you're in one. Yeah, right. If you think those, you know, imagine being in an actual war and you hear bullets whizzing by your head. And you just go, that, well, is that a bug? Mm. You know, boy, the, did someone open a window? I feel a draft. <laughs> no, that was, you know, uh, that was a, you know, <laughs> that was a bullet zinging by your head. Oh, was that a fly? Mosquitoes are getting big this year. People just blowing up everywhere. And if we could look around spiritually, that's what we're in. And, you know, we're spiritually, there's landmines. Right. And people are getting blown up today. Because they're not, they don't, why? Because they don't recognize what they're in. 
You know, they're in the Christian life and they think they're, that it's a church picnic. They think that they're just, you know, just going to la di da their way to heaven. No, when you, got, when you signed up for the Christian life, you signed up for war. <clears throat> so, if you need to, first of all, you need, how are you going to win? You need to recognize the fact that we're in a spiritual war. And that's what the first half of this sermon has been all about. It's just trying to help us to understand that we have the old man, we have this old nature, we still have the flesh to deal with, that we have to bring it into subjection, that it is at enmity with God, and then we have a fight to, to, uh, to fight. We have a war to fight. Now, go over to, I should have you stay there, but go to Ephesians chapter 4. So Ephesians chapter 4, he's admonishing them in verse 22, and he says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in your spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created after God, and, uh, uh, which is created after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So he's saying, look, you have to put this off. You have to put off the former conversation. You have to put on the new man. That's a daily thing. But notice the context. How are you going to do this? What's going to help you put on the new man? What's going to help you put off the old man? What's going to help you walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus? Look at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in unity of the faith. So what's he talking about there? He's talking about church, friend. And that's a big reason of why we ought to get in church on a regular basis. Amen. It's because of the fact that you need to be in church to win this war. Amen. You know, who else is going to tell you that you're in a spiritual fight? Right. No one on the, you know, unless you're watching sound preaching on the internet, <laughs> nobody else is going to do it. Cable television isn't going to tell you that you as a Christian are involved in a spiritual fight. Church is going to do that. Right. So we need to be in church. <clears throat> if salvation is, let me put it to you this way, salvation is conscription. Okay, When you got saved, you got conscripted into the, into the, into the war. You say, I, I didn't know it was going to be war. Too bad, you're in it. You're in it now. That's what conscription is. It's the draft. It's not a volunteer army. When you got saved, whether you like it or not, you signed up for a fight. And you can either go and fight and win and be victorious, or you can be a casualty of war. And that's it. Those are your options. So if salvation is conscription, is you being signed up for war, whether you like it or not, you know what church is? Church is boot camp. Church is where you're going to learn how to use the weapon, how you're going to learn how to lace up the boots, tuck in the shirt, march in order, take orders, understand the enemy, right. and go out and fight. That's what church is. It's boot camp. <clears throat> and don't expect to win a Christian don't expect to win the, uh, this. Excuse me, win this spiritual fight, this battle, if you're not in church. It's not going to happen. I mean, that's one of the first things the devil tries to do because he understands that church is where you learn how to fight and where you get the training that you need. So, what's one of the one of the things he loves to do is get Christians out of church, get them offended about something, get them to, you know, think they know better or whatever. However, he can do it, he'll do it. Just get them backslidden. Well, it's only a couple, you know, I'll just start. First, I'll just, you know, I've been going pretty regularly. I'll just, I'll, you know, I'm going to scale back to once a week. Then I'm going to scale back to once a month. Weeks will go by, friend. Months will go by. And then before you know it, you'll be looking back and years will have gone by. And you'll wake up and you know what? <laughs> You're just like that guy in the war that didn't spend enough time in boot camp and was just cannon fodder. Right. Just someone, you know, laying on the ground. Blown up. So church is boot camp. We need to get in church. Amen. <clears throat> and it's going to teach us how to put on the armor. Look there in Ephesians chapter 6. God doesn't just call us and put us in this fight you know, with no protection, with no training. He gives, us the, the, he gives us the church. He gives us the teachers. He gives us the prophets. He gives us the brothers and sisters in Christ. He rallies the troops together. He teaches them the fight and he gives them armor, spiritual armor. Look here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Again, you can't fight this battle on your own. You need his strength to do it. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil has wiles that need to be stood against. You know, he's crafty, he's cunning, he's subtle, he's going to fight you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, excuse me, that you may be able to uh, withstand in the evil day, and having to done, uh, done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the, all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I mean, is this not the, the, the language of a man who's going out to battle, who understands that the Christian life is a fight spiritually? And people would rather read this and say, take unto you the, you know, the ping pong paddle and the foosball table and the cotton candy machine and the ballroom or the, uh, the, the, the ball pit. And you can find those churches. That's how they're going to equip you. They're going to give you a spiritual, it's not going to be boot camp. It's going to be spiritual you know, party time. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be like the, the, the play place at McDonald's. When you get in a, in a Baptist church that's preaching the Bible, that's not holding anything back, that's doing the work of God, you know, that's the boot camp that you need. That's the one's going to help you put on this armor. Amen. It's not going to be the, the fun center down there that's going to throw you in the spiritual McDonald's play place and expect you to, you're going to fight a war because you went down the tube slide? You know, and you got the 48, 48 days of grace or whatever? You got in your small group and talked about the love of God for the hundredth time. <coughs> we need to learn to put on this armor. We do that in church, friend. And he says, you know, I mean, the breastplate of righteousness. What kind of armor is that? You know, that's what's going to protect your heart. How do you do that? Well, it's the breastplate of righteousness. You know, godly living, clean living, desiring godly things, involving yourself in godly things. That's going to protect your heart. This, God, this, right, this breastplate of righteousness. Having your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Having your feet shod with the gospel. You know, that's an offensive maneuver. Yep. That's what soul winning is. It's an offensive maneuver. Amen. We're not just here to, to, to hold the line. Right. We're here to fight back. Amen. To take back ground from the enemy. Right. And, uh, you know, that's That's offensive. You know what I love about this armor? There's nothing for the back. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing mentioned about your, your hinder parts so that when you turn tail and run, God's still going to protect you. You know, if you turn tail and run and say, oh, I'm not going to fight this fight. You know, God doesn't protect that part. Anything can happen. It's, al it's almost like God's just saying, yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah. You can have that one. I'll invest in this one over here that's facing the right direction. That wants to charge forward. He says the shield of faith. You know, we need to believe the promises of God's word. The shield of faith. Trust. Trusting in God's word. The helmet of salvation. You know, what would really help a lot of us is just remembering the hope that we have in Christ. And some days, that's all you're going to have, it feels like. When you're fighting this battle and the, it just seems like the world's against you, nothing's going your way, the, it, you know, the flesh is, is, is winning, it just feels like you're getting pulled back. And it's, what's the point? I'm going to give up. Well, you still have the helmet of salvation, friend. You're still saved. You know, let that protect your mind from the devil, you know, trying to influence you. Remember the hope that we have in Christ. That no matter how hard it gets, how hot the battle is, that it's a, it's a, we're, we're fighting a, a, a victory that's already been won. Yeah, right. It's just not over yet. We, we still have to fight it. <clears throat> the sword of the Spirit. You know, again, offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit. That's talking about the Bible. And, and again, that's why we need, that's our weapon. You know, that book that you have in your hand is your weapon. So here's the thing. Are you familiar with your weapon? That's what they teach you in boot camp, isn't it? They teach you how to handle a gun. They, they say, this is your gun. This is, you know, the model. This is the caliber. This is how you rack a, the slide. This is how you put in a clip. This is how you aim it. This is the safety, on, off. All, you know, they teach you how to point that thing and shoot. 
And, you know, we have a weapon in our hands today. God has given us a mighty weapon, Amen. sharper than any two-edged sword. And the question is, are we using it? Are we getting familiar with it? Are we learning how to use that weapon effectively, skillfully, so that we can go out and, you know, we can fight back? You know, fight our own battles personally, understanding where the Bible, what part of the Bible is going to encourage you to not give in to that temptation? What part of the Bible do you need to turn to to help you fight the battle that you're in in your personal life? What part of the Bible do you need to turn to to help somebody else who's struggling in an area? What part of the Bible do you need to turn to to go and win a soul to Christ? Are we familiar with that? Do we know that? Do we know our weapon? I mean, would you, I mean think about it in, 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 in the physical world. If you were in a real battle and say, hey, you're going to war tomorrow, you'd probably want to know, you'd probably know exactly where your gun is. And if you hadn't bit gotten familiar with it, you'd be up all night. How does this thing work again? Uh, you'd be on YouTube. How to fire up, you know, whatever. Right. How to handle this thing. Well, I, I missed boot camp. You know, but I mean, what about us spiritually? Is that the way it is with our Bible? Is it, just, it just sits over there. It just sits over here. We, well, where is it? We don't even know. <clears throat> we should know the Word of God. That is your weapon. Right. It's the only weapon you have. Where's the other weapon in this armor? There isn't one. This is the only weapon you have. And by the way, it's the only weapon you need. You don't need uh, you know, a commentary. You don't, you don't need some other man's opinion on the Word of God. You need the Word of God itself. So what I'm trying to encourage you to do tonight is to get involved in this fight. And if you're already involved in this fight, to stay in it. And understand that you are in a fight, that you are in a war. Welcome to the war is the title of the sermon tonight. Welcome to the war. <clears throat> and understand this, that the Christian life is not a passive one. The Christian life is not just you skipping down the primrose path to heaven. You know, it is not a passive existence. It's a life of spiritual warfare. And you know what? Quite frankly, I'm glad it is. Because it makes, you know, otherwise it would be dull. It'd just be boring if it wasn't a war. I mean, at least war is exciting. I mean, for all the negative things that come with it, you know, gets the adrenaline going. It's, it's at least, you know, keeps our interests. Yeah. It gives us something to fight for, something that matters. That's right. And that's what we're involved with, a, a life of spiritual warfare with real enemies that mean us harm. The enemy's real today, and he wants to get us. And he wants every single person in this church out of here. Yeah. He wants every single person in this church to backslide and quit on God and not fight. Why? Because he knows the potential you have if you get in that book, if you get to know your sword, if you get your armor on and get serious about serving Christ, he knows the potential every single one of us in this room have. You know, he looks out here and he sees all these kids and he doesn't, he doesn't want preachers to come up out of this church. Right. He doesn't want some uh, young boy to get on fire for God, some young man to get on fire for God and decide, I'm going to go preach the gospel, I'm going to go start a church. He doesn't want that to happen. He's going to fight that person. He's trying to quench that in that person. He wants them out of church. He doesn't want that mom and dad who want to just live for Christ and raise their children for Christ. He doesn't want them to do that. Right. He wants them to quit on God and take their whole family with them and go back to the world. He wants them to give up. Every single one of us. We have a real bat uh, battle to fight. We have a real enemy tonight. And he's not to be taken lightly. And we can't just flirt with sin. We can't just play with sin and think that it's not going to harm us. And failing to recognize this, failing to understand that you're in a battle, that you have an enemy, if you fail to not understand this and recognize it, that will be your undoing. That will be your undoing. So we need to understand this. We need to understand that we're in a battle. We need to get serious about this fight. We need to be proactive in, in getting to know the Word of God and, and, and reaching out into our community and going into enemy territory and taking back some of these souls for Christ. Let's go ahead and pray.